today our theme is establishing the glorious city, establishing the glorious city. Remember as we came to the end of Hebrews, we saw at the end of Hebrews that we've been brought to this great biblical climax of seeing that there is a city whose maker and builder is God and we have been brought to that city in Christ and that city is the dwelling place of the spirits of just men made perfect and angels in festal assembly and so forth but even more importantly it is the city of God and it is the dwelling place if we could speak in that term it is the dwelling place of the Lamb of God the voice from the throne is the voice of God but one with the throne and hidden in the throne so to speak is the Lamb who is one with the Father and so we have come to this great city and over the last week or two we've been thinking about what it means that there is such a city and by contrast there is another city uh, called the city of man also known as Babylon spiritually understood in the scriptures and we were speaking last time about the destruction of that city and how God destroys Satan within his own stronghold he comes in Jesus Christ right into the very heart of Satan's lair into the very centre of the city and there he destroys the work of the devil within his own nest. And so this week we come to the other side of that and hence the title Establishing the Glorious City and really there are two things to take away from today. One is that there is a city which is established and whose maker and builder is God and I think there is just an enormous spiritual battle about that very point the fact is that the world and the flesh Babylon herself this great harlot city tells us there is no such thing and day by day there's a sort of program of disinformation to dissuade us from the reality that there is a city which is established whose maker and builder is God and that that city will not be moved but the second thing that is part of what we need to say today is that that city is our home this other city is not our home and I think a huge percentage of the problems that we have in our lives is because those problems come because we want to make this city our home instead of that city our home and there's a huge spiritual conflict which rages and the aim of that conflict is to persuade us that we don't belong to that city which is yet to come and to persuade us that we actually are more comfortable and better off serving the city called Babylon here and now now those two things really underpin everything I want to say today by way of introduction I want to just make an observation and that is the title establishing the city of God is somewhat misleading it's somewhat misleading because a the city of God does not have to be created so to speak in history it just is it has always been and it always will be and the work of redemption does not create the city so much as bring us in to that city which is already existing I'll explain more of that as we go through and secondly the title may be somewhat misleading because establishing the city of God may indicate that that city of God could only be established when the false city Babylon is destroyed and in a way that's partly true but it's partly wrong because that city of God which has an eternal existence about which we'll say more in a moment that city of God destroys and judges the false city because of the substantial nature of the city of God's existence it doesn't destroy that false city because somehow that false city is a threat to it or because somehow the foundations of the city of God are tottering and they're only just being held together barely 
until that city is destroyed. But that city of God is so strong, so eternal, so pure, so holy, so enduring in God that the action of that city cannot but be to destroy that which opposes it and that from one point of view establishes the city of God but from another point of view it just confirms what has always been there and it shows that that false harlot city has accomplished nothing so that that false harlot city may imprison the saints of God it may try for a season to deceive them, to lure them, to tempt them, to bring them into states of confusion and despair, to lead them astray by greed or lust or bitterness or something else. But finally that wicked harlot city doesn't prevail. It may behead the saints of God and not one, of, one hair of their head is harmed. It may destroy, in its view, the church of God and the church of God is not touched. That's how substantial is the eternal city of God to which we belong and of which we're a part. And the third thing, just to say by way of introduction, is this, that nothing we've said in the last few weeks about the cities, indeed anything that can be said about God and his kingdom, the gospel which he has established and so forth. But in particular about these cities, nothing can be seen unless it be revealed by the Holy Spirit. Uh, there are a number of places in the book of the Revelation where you get perhaps the very clearest picture of these two cities and the conflict in which they are engaged. And when it comes to the harlot city, Babylon, John has to be taken up in the Holy Spirit and taken away to a wilderness where that city really is. She thinks she's sitting in the midst of luxury and splendour but she's actually out in the middle of the wilderness. And there in the Spirit he sees her for what she really is. And conversely when it comes time for him to see the new Jerusalem, the holy city coming down out of heaven from God he has to be taken away, taken away in the spirit to a high mountain and there shine her as well. And the implication of those statements is that one would never see either the true nature of the false city or the true nature of the real city unless the spirit of God opened our eyes. And he does that of course uh, to us all as the church he has commissioned the writing of the scriptures and he's commended those scriptures to us but he speaks personally to each one. There comes to us in the spirit a revelation. It's as though the scales fall off our eyes and we see that city which has been so alluring and attractive and has seemed to offer us so much. We see that city for what she really is and it sickens us. And it sickens us that we've been part of it and it sickens us that we could be so deceived. But that's the action of the Holy Spirit. Fiery dove, what are you doing here? We've just sung. And by the same token, that Holy Spirit personally comes to us, each one, and to the church together. And particularly during times of suffering, when uh, death is near and life is vain in the terms of the hymn that we sometimes sing then it's like the gates of that glorious city are opened up and you see, you see the reality like you've never seen it before. It's a ministry of the spirit, not a ministry of the flesh. And it's possible for us even to come to church and to have a mindset, so to speak, a way of thinking which is more ordered by the city of man than the city of God. Come to church and perhaps the first thing in our thinking and the central thing in our thinking is what am I going to get out of this today? That's a hallmark of the way in which the city thinks because the city tells you that it's all about you. In fact, it's all about your destruction. It's not all about you. And the hallmark of the city of God is that it takes our eyes out of ourselves and out of our circumstances 
and out of the ways we would normally evaluate ourselves and our circumstances and reaches us and grounds us in the great eternities of life. So with all of those things by way of introduction there are three or four things to say. Firstly, today I want to talk about the eternal nature of that city. The crazy, you're having a great time today, isn't it? You know that text that's in Corinthians, we shall not sleep but we shall all be changed? It's <laughs> the crèche is on song today. <laughs> Perhaps they might need some extra hands if there's anyone who's, who's available. <laughs> Don't everybody go. We need someone left here. So the eternal nature of that city, first of all, is what we'll concentrate on. The means of entry into that city is what we'll see secondly. And then the central feature of that city, the city of God I'm speaking of, and what that means for our hope. So those things we'll cover briefly today. Firstly, the eternal nature of the city. You remember in Hebrews chapter 12, it speaks of us coming to Mount Zion. It says, you have come to Mount Zion. You have come to the city of the living God. And that tells us that that city already exists. The action of God in redemption, as the writer of Hebrews has explained it to us, is to bring us to a place which already is. You have come. It's not that he's saying this action of redemption has created a place which was not before, but you have been enabled by the action of redemption to come to a place which has already been and already exists in eternity, that is the city of God. But it's not simply a city city, if I could put it that way. The uh, biblical language is remarkably flexible and rich and deep and full and heavy with meaning, so to speak. And so if you were to trace through the theme of the city of God in the scriptures, you will find that there are parallels with things like Mount Zion, the holy hill, the dwelling place of God, the tabernacle, uh, the temple, the new Jerusalem, Eden, paradise. All of those things are saying the same thing, but they're saying them differently. The city is the new Jerusalem. The city is the temple. The city is Eden. The city is the holy hill. But if you look at it from the point of view of Eden, it teaches you one thing. If you look at it from the point of view from the temple, it teaches you another thing. If you look at it from the point of view of the mountain of the Lord, it teaches you another thing. So that you could follow all of those streams and all of those streams would coalesce in this great central theme of the scriptures called the city of God. And those things of which we speak, the city, garden, holy hill, temple, tabernacle, they are not concepts. We're not here this morning, I trust, we are not here talking about ideas which are helpful. If you want hints and tips and ideas that might be helpful, well, you can get those from a sociology or a psychology textbook. We're talking not today about helpful ideas or helpful concepts. We're talking about biblical and eternal realities. And those Ways of speaking, we could speak about them as images, we could speak about them as pictures. Better, we could speak about them as biblical realities. The garden, temple, mountain, holy hill, dwelling place, bride, city are all telling us things that are of eternal importance for us. They're telling us about our nature as the people of God they're telling us about the destiny of the creation. They're telling us about God's character and his plan and purpose. And they're telling us all of those things differently but saying the same thing differently. 
as a, a friend of mine once said many, many years ago, in our sinfulness, we're all the same, only different. <laughs> Every man sins the same way, but we all sin differently. In a positive way, these things that we're saying about the temple city of God, garden city, they're all the same, but they're different and we need to understand the richness of that tapestry that the scripture weaves together. But the central reality perhaps to which we can point and the central thing that those uh, images, those biblical realities, that pictures, language, the way they speak, the central thing is this, that the city has the glory of God. Uh, Revelation chapter 21 verse 11 he took me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and he showed me the bride, the wife of the lamb, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God and the best translations say having the glory of God or it may have a new sentence there the city has the glory of God it's important to preserve that word has or having because it's indicating that the glory that the city has, it really, really has. It's not just a temporary manifestation that it looks pretty spectacular. That's the way Babylon works. It has a temporary uh, attractiveness and gaudiness about it if you read, read in Revelation 17 and 18. She looks really spectacular, but when you get up close, it's all plastic surgery and collagen. There's nothing substantial about it. But when you actually come to see the city, it's not as though she has just the appearance of glory. She actually has the glory. And she has the glory of God. And the reason that she has the glory of God, we'll come back to this in a little while, the reason that she has the glory of God is because she has Christ. Or to put it better, because Christ has her. She is the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And all of the glory of God is embodied in Jesus Christ. And in the covenant of marriage, all that belongs to the husband becomes the wife's. And in the way of speaking about our maturity of sonship, when we see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We will be conformed to the image of the son. In other words, to say that she has the glory of God is to say, you and I, we, the church of God, the community of the redeemed, this multitude that no man can number from every tribe. We have the glory because we have Christ. We do not reflect the glory for a short fading period, but Christ has given himself to us in the covenant of divine marriage. And all that he is, he brings to us. And all that he is, he shares with us. And all that he has, he bestows upon us. And my beloved is mine in that city and he is and we are his and his banner over us is love because he's united us together with himself in that wonderful work of divine marriage and his glory he does not keep to himself but brings to us so that we and he may share in the same glory about which we'll say more shortly. But as James was leading us earlier in the service he alluded to something which is so significant. That glory does not consist of our possessions. It consists of what he makes us to be in himself. James alluded to the fact that there has been from eternity a divine community in Christian theology we speak about that divine community as the Trinity, the triune oneness of Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And as we've said in some of the marriage services we've taken recently, what you see in the internal life of the Trinity 
the mutual love and giving and sharing and honouring and self-giving and thanksgiving, that internal life pours out to us through the creation and we see through the creation the way God is in himself because of what he's revealed to us in his son. So that tells us what our relationships are like. It tells us what marriage is like. It tells us what fatherhood is like. It tells us what sonship is about. It tells us how to be husbands and how to be brides and so forth. But the point is that that relational life of the city, community, temple, bride, dwelling place, mountain of God's people, that relational life is one with the life of the triune God because that's all the life there is. See, the harlot city tells us there's another life you can have out here and it's all about you and it's all about your receiving and it's all about your getting and your grasping and it's all about your climbing up the slippery ladder to the top. And But that is not life. It's death. To exist in that city is to exist in death. Here in this city, where you have the life of that triune community, that is life, because that's all the life there is. And in the remarkable miracle of new birth and regeneration, a person who's belonged to that city is united to Christ, and by virtue of being united to Christ, they are united to Christ in God and are brought right into the heart of that relational life of the triune God and that is their life. And sure, it's contested. And sure, there's a battle. And Romans 7 figures pretty big in our experience, doesn't it? But this is where you live now in the reality of that triune community. That's why we could say that from this point of view, the city has always existed. It's always been because it's in God. So what is the mean or what are the means of entry into that city? And here we <coughs> just come talking about the city by talking about Eden because Eden was the garden city. It is very interesting, by the way, isn't it, that all of the great cities of the world pride themselves on their gardens and they use gardens to offset their architecture. So in the original Eden city, there was no architecture to draw your glory eye away from God. The garden was the glorious presence of God. So the big cities of the world, the great cities of the world, you visit Paris or central part of Tokyo or anywhere else, What's the one in New York? Everywhere you go, there's a garden in the city. But they use gardens to enhance the city. It's got a different purpose. And isn't it very significant that what was the, the great thing or one of the great things that marked out ancient Babylon? The hanging gardens and the central feature of Babylonian architecture was the mountain, the ziggurat with all of the gardens adorning it can't think of anything original can we, it's all there originally in the creation and we copy it and use it wrongly the point that we need to get to is this when human sin happened when the serpent tempted our first parents and when they listened to that word that did not change Eden one whit it did not change it one whit Eden was not changed to a wasteland the wasteland was outside of Eden and so they were consigned to life outside. But sin, evil, wickedness, all of the plans and schemes of the devil, they haven't changed Eden. 
It could never change Eden. Because Eden is the dwelling place of God. You could no more change Eden than you could change God. So the couple are sent out of Eden and there, out of Eden, they seek to establish a city. Cain was the first city builder and you can trace the history of those cities all the way through. But they try and re-establish outside of Eden in the Garden City, hanging gardens of Babylon, sanctuary, mountain, places of fellowship with their gods. We try and establish outside of Eden what we had in Eden. But God has preserved Eden and he put a sword, you remember? A cherubim with a flaming sword and it flashed in every direction on the east side and try as you like, you can't get past him. Now some of you will remember some of these things that we've said on earlier occasions but there is a very close relationship between the way in which Eden is pictured and the tabernacle and temple are built and when you came through the eastern entrance or the east entrance which was the main entrance into the tabernacle what was the first thing that you saw beyond the court where the priests were ministering? The great altar of fire. The great altar of holocaust. And you couldn't proceed into there except in the person of the priests. And you couldn't proceed in the most holy place at all except in the person of the high priest. You stayed here as though you were looking at Eden from the outside. The fiery sword is still there in the altar of Holocaust. And the only way that there's any representation of you in there through the priests and then finally in the high priest in the holy place, the only way through is through the fiery sacrifice of judgment. So Christ has the second or the last Adam, as Paul talks about him, says what? Let that sword come to me. Awake, O sword, against my advocate. Awake, O sword, against my companion. So the sword of the holy fire of judgment comes on a new Adam. And he passes in to Eden through the judgment. He comes from Eden, if we could speak this way. He comes from the eternal dwelling place of God. He comes from the city, from the tabernacle, from the mountain, from the temple. And he comes out into the wilderness where we are. And he finds us there as these lost sheep. And he brings us back into the city in his own flesh and blood, representing us, standing with us, identifying with us, and in his own flesh and blood, uniting us to himself on that cross, all of the fire of judgment comes upon us in him, comes upon him for us, and as we enter through him, we come back into that place from which he has come. But when he comes back in, he says, Behold me, and all the children you've given me. We're all here now. All present and accounted to, Father. Not one of the children is lost. Not one of the sheep is finally destroyed. But there's no entrance into Eden, no way back into the city, unless it be through that judgment. You can't climb up by some other way and get in. But the whole world out here is trying to find another way. Everything you look at that's telling you what to buy and what to think and how to spiritualise your life and which guru to go to, it's all telling you that there's another way back. Try this way, try that way, try that way. No, there's no way back into Eden except it be through that fire of judgement in Christ. And he brings us back in he brings us back in and by bringing us back in he has to destroy Babylon which has held us. So he comes from the holy eternal city out into the wilderness where all of this other pseudo counterfeit parody city actions happening 
And in order to set the captives free, just like the exiles had to be set free from Jerusalem, he has to actually destroy Babylon in his action of grace, which he does. And that leads us to an observation which is very, very simple but utterly important. God's plan and purpose, please hear this very carefully, God's plan and purpose is not to transform the city of man so that it will one day be the city of God. He is not transforming Adam. He has to kill Adam and raise up a second Adam. He's not interested in a process which is going to gradually, bit by bit, transform the city of man so that it's something else. He actually has to destroy it. That's what he does in Christ. He takes away its power by destroying the evil one in its lair. And the central feature, if that's the means of entry, is through Christ. And the central feature is very simply put. Also during the week I've been reading a book uh, called Yahweh is a Warrior. Some of you may have already read that years ago. I read it once uh, ages ago and have reread it this week. It's very helpful. Not warrior as in the sense of an anxious person, but warrior as in the sense of a battle master, battle leader. Yahweh is a warrior. And in that um, wonderful book, the author makes this simple observation at one point, which I thought just opened up a whole new world of thinking. But when you look at all of the ancient Near Eastern myths, the Egyptians and Babylonians and Canaanites and all the others, and they have their sort of version of how the world came to be and what's going to happen to it. If you look, for example, at the Babylonian ones or the Egyptian ones, the end point of the creation myths and the battle of the gods and how Marduk comes to be top of the pile for Babylon's, for example, the end point of those is the nation-state city and it exercises power. What's the end point of the creation accounts in Genesis 1 and 2? Family. Family. What is the central feature of the city of God? It's the voice of the Father. In all those other creation stories, the gods make human beings as their slaves to serve their needs. And that's the way the gods will still treat you if you want to go and meet with them. In the biblical account, it's not a myth, in the biblical account, God the Father creates a dwelling place for his family and the central feature of the city, garden, temple, mountain, tabernacle, worship place is the Father's voice. That's why the city has the glory of God because it has the word of God the Father, Jesus Christ. It has Jesus Christ as its foundation and it has Jesus Christ as its glory because it has Jesus Christ as the husband and Jesus Christ is the word of God. And as he comes into the world, the word of God the Father calls out and all who hear his voice come to the Father through him. And Jesus says, as he's calling to the multitudes, if anyone comes to me, they come to me because the Father has given them to come to me. And so the Father speaks his word in the midst of history. He speaks in the midst of the wilderness of all of our city building and he calls out as the Father's voice to us. And his sheep hear his voice. Another way of speaking is that he comes to gather the children of God scattered abroad through the earth 
And as we hear the voice of the Son calling and he calls us by name and we recognise the name that he uses to call us, he doesn't just do a scattergun thing, he actually calls our names and we come to him and in him he brings us to the Father and all glory goes to him. God the Father through Jesus the Son but the central feature of that city is the voice of the Father calling to his children and the children stand in the Son, through the Son and we reflect the glory of God the Father in him. What's your destiny as a man or a woman in Christ? It is to be conformed to the image of Christ himself and in being conformed to the image of Christ you will love the Father as he loves the Father. You will know the Father as Jesus the man knows the Father. You will worship the Father as Jesus the man worships him. You will speak the word of the Father as Jesus speaks the word of the Father. You will be in the fellowship of the Father through his spirit as Jesus is in the fellowship of the Father through his spirit. That's what you're created for. And the word of God the Father has come out into the wilderness to bring you to unite him, you to himself, to bring you under that sword of holy judgment so that there's no, how could I put it, illegitimate children coming through. You have to be reborn in him, through him. It's only legitimate children in the sun that come through. But as that new humanity stands there, you stand in Christ, worshipping God the Father. Christ is all and all to you. And because Jesus is all and all to you, the Father is all and all to us all in him. So every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Zephaniah, the other reading we've had today. Zephaniah chapter 3. Rejoice, O daughter of Zion, because the King is in your midst the Lord of hosts is in your midst he's brought you he's come right in amongst us he's brought us by his voice to know his father he's led us in himself as the great Melchizedekian high priest we've heard about it all in Hebrews he's brought us right into the inner sanctuary and finally that beloved that is the hope in which we live. I think a lot of our battle is a battle about which word we will hear. In the beginning in Eden, the moment they gave ear to the voice of the serpent, that giving ear to his voice opened the gates of the city of man to them and closed the gates on the city of God. Now, you and I, as men and women in Christ, we can assume, if not, you need to be born again. You must be born again. You're not going to get in by some other way. But if we are men and women in Christ, you are in that city now by virtue of being in Christ. but you don't see fully where you are yet by virtue of still being in this body. And every day there's a battle that comes where Babylon, the false city, is telling you this is where you really are and you're not there. And this is what you really need and you don't need that. And this is how you really fix yourself up and you don't need that city and this is where your real treasure and inheritance is and you don't need that city. See, it's not the battle every day, <coughs> finally, <coughs> a battle for which word you will hear. Do you wake up some mornings and even though for all intents and purposes you've had six or seven or eight or whatever hours sleep you've had, it's been like you've been in a boxing match? And you wake up some mornings and it's like this moment you open your eyes or even before 
there's just chatter on your shoulders. So what do you do? You say, no, I'm a man or a woman in Christ. All of the accusation, whatever the world and the flesh and the devil and the city bring to us, all of that accusation has no basis because I'm in Christ. I actually am a citizen of that city. Now, I'm not just sitting here in between. I'm not sort of out of Babylon and waiting for the bus to take me to the new Jerusalem and I'm just sort of sitting on a platform in the middle wondering which one's going to come past first. A bus going one way or a bus going the other. You've been taken out in Christ, brought in, and that's where you are. Your citizenship is in heaven. But every day, that city's using everything that it has and its arsenal is very impressive, I must say, to tell us, well, you're either on a bus or you're more that direction than that direction. But you're actually in, in Christ, and what you find in the last day is a revelation of what is rather than just a creation of something that's never been before. So you are formed by the word of God as he comes to you and he calls your name and he brings you out and you're kept by that word of God as he intercedes for you now as a citizen of that heaven you wait fully for the revelation of your position and for your status to be revealed he keeps you now by his intercession but in Christ through the spirit you will be conformed to his image and you will be fully deeply, finally, richly, overwhelmingly settled in that city which is your home. And that's the hope to which we press. Now sometimes because our lives are so comfy, good Australian word comfy, you don't find that in other parts of the world, you don't realise how much that city actually means to us until it's very uncomfy. And then in the spirit you've realised that that city finally is all you've ever wanted. Even though it's been contested along the way, that city is also all you've ever needed. So it's God's grace that he makes it all a bit uncomfy for us sometimes to bring us in and to assure us of the hope that's set before us. I'm going to pray and then sing. Father, how can any human voice speak of these things and how inadequate is every statement that we make except it be revealed by your Holy Spirit that this is so. So grant to us in your blessed spirit the revelation for which we crave of the city to which we belong and enable us, Father, to see who you are and what you have done in bringing us into that city through your Son. And Father, if there be any person here who is yet to enter Is there any person who has not yet received the gift of forgiveness and new birth by your Holy Spirit this morning, Father? Come, convict of sin, righteousness and judgment and that that judgment has been finished in Christ on the cross and cause us all to enter in, we pray, in Jesus' name.